someone new and I introduce myself as a chemist, I generally get one of two responses. Either, oh, I hated chemistry in high school, <laughs> or it must be awesome to get to blow things up. <sighs> I will be the first to admit that chemistry is a difficult subject and that I have to work really hard to achieve a deep understanding. I will also be the first to admit that blowing things up is a really convenient way to get students' attention. An often unspoken part of that conversation about chemistry revolves around people's fear of chemicals. As a mom of two young kids, it is not uncommon for me to find in my social media feeds advertisements for chemical-free living to protect my family. If you search on the internet, you'll find lots of products you can buy that are supposedly chemical-free. With that in mind, I ask you to take a look at this list of ingredients and ask yourself, would you be worried about eating something that's represented by this list of chemical ingredients? In fact, you shouldn't. This is a partial list of chemical ingredients present in a banana. So, as a chemist, I find these ideas of chemical-free living and products kind of maddening. Of course, we are all made of chemicals. DNA is a chemical, vitamins are chemicals, water is a chemical. As a chemist, my goal is to find ways to use chemistry to enhance human experience while also promoting a healthy environment. When I was a junior in high school, I certainly wasn't cognizant of this goal yet, but I realize now that that is what drew me to chemistry in the first place. I didn't consider myself to be particularly like math or science-minded, and that first day in my chemistry class, I sat in the front row, because I was definitely that kid, and my chemistry teacher did a big, loud combustion reaction at the front of the room as a demonstration. I was a pyrophobe, and I left the room freaked out. I went back the second day, and I sat near the back of the room, just in case. That day, we watched a video about careers in chemistry. I remember one segment in particular. There was a woman wearing some kind of a hazmat suit wading through a lake of toxic waste. She was taking samples so that she could bring them back to the lab to figure out a way that chemistry could remediate that site. I was totally inspired by that woman and by the power of chemistry. Now, I was not very savvy about higher education. I knew I wanted to go to college, but I had no idea that I would go to graduate school and do a postdoc and eventually become a chemistry professor at a top-tier research institution. Along that long educational journey, I became interested in a subfield of chemistry called nanoscience. And I'm guessing a lot of you have a general sense for what it means for something to be nano-sized, right? That it's really, really tiny, and you're right. To be a little more accurate, something is on the nanoscale if it has at least one dimension that's somewhere between 10 to the minus 9 and 10 to the minus 7 meters in length. Some items that are nanoscale include the thickness of a cell membrane, most molecules, and many viruses. Some things that we think of as being really tiny that are actually significantly larger than the nanoscale include individual bacteria or red blood cells, the water droplets that make up fog, and the head of a pin. Over the last couple decades, scientists have come up with some amazing new tools to visualize nanoscale objects that were invisible to us before that. So here, let me show you an example. This is an image taken by one of my collaborators. These are nanoscale silica particles, so the same as glass or sand. And I'd like you to try to guess, what is the macroscale object that demonstrates these nanoscale features? As I zoom out, what you'll see is that these nanoparticles are naturally occurring features on the underside of a ladybug. These tiny objects are all around us. That said, being tiny is not the only criterion for something to be considered a nanoparticle or part of nanotechnology. In addition to the small size, they must also display unexpected chemical or physical properties. Let me give you an example. If I handed you a bulk chunk of gold, you would happily wear it as a necklace without ever worrying that it was going to react with chemicals around you. If instead I handed you a test tube full of gold nanoparticles, you would find that they would catalyze a host of chemical reactions. These new chemical and physical properties mean, of course, that nanoparticles can be really useful in a wide variety of products. And so in the last 10 or 15 years, there have actually been a large array of products that purposefully include engineered nanoparticles. I am sure that you have a product that contains engineered nanoparticles in your pocket or in your home right now. In addition, many nanoparticles are currently in clinical trials for a variety of therapeutic applications. So, scientists, engineers, product developers all got really excited about engineered nanoparticles when the beginning, at the beginning of this field. 
And rightly so. They essentially present a whole new dimension on the periodic table. And like many emerging technologies, there was probably too much hype and too many expectations at the beginning. Contrary to that positive hype, there was also a cadre of nanoparticle naysayers suggesting, for example, that self-replicating nanorobots were going to take over our planet. Now, I don't think either of those hype extremes are going to be borne out, but I am convinced that nanoparticles have the potential to really benefit our society and overcome some of our biggest technological challenges. Now, as chemists like me are designing new engineered nanoparticles, I think we would be smart to pay attention to the cautionary tales from the past where revolutionary new chemicals were widely applied and then found to have environmental impacts. Let me give you three high-profile examples. First, asbestos. Asbestos was widely used as a building material and a coating until we realized it caused the disease known as mesothelioma. Second, chlorofluorocarbons, also known as CFCs, used as fire retardants and refrigerants until we discovered they were the cause of the ozone layer hole. Third, DDT, also known as dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane, was a really effective insecticide that we used until we found out that it compromised both avian and marine wildlife. The use of all three of these chemicals was discontinued based on the environmental impact, despite their utility. Now, I'm not saying that I think nanoparticles are going to have those effects, but I do think that scientists designing new engineered nanoparticles have a responsibility to be proactive rather than reactive when it comes to designing nanomaterials for safe and sustainable use. So, Nanoparticles actually have a lot of potential to help us in a variety of fields related to sustainability, including food and health and water. I'm going to focus today on one particular area, and that is clean energy, arguably one of the largest challenges of our era. Nanoparticles are already very important in a variety of energy applications. They are important in high-efficiency solar cells, high-strength windmill blades, and avoiding transmission losses during electricity transmission. So, nanoparticles definitely have solutions for some of our energy challenges. I'll focus on one major challenge related to lithium-ion batteries and a team of multidisciplinary collaborating scientists, myself included, that are working to proactively design these materials so that they can have maximal technological impact while having minimal unintended environmental consequences. So, lithium-ion batteries are all around us. We have all come to rely on devices that operate using lithium-ion batteries. So, one thing that's interesting is that nanoparticles are essentially beginning to create the next generation of lithium-ion batteries. So first, let me tell you how lithium-ion batteries work, and then I'll tell you why nanoparticles are so important. In general, batteries store and release energy by moving electrons from one side of a battery to the other. The two sides of the battery are commonly known as the anode and the cathode. Anodes are commonly made out of carbon. Cathodes have a more variable composition, but are often metal oxides. Between the anode and the cathode is a conducting material known as the electrolyte. And in lithium-ion batteries, this electrolyte contains lithium ions, the yellow spheres in this diagram. When your battery is operating, those positively charged lithiums are moving towards the metal cathode, giving it a positive charge. Then, negatively charged electrons want to flow to offset that charge, meaning that your device is working. The phone that contains your lithium-ion battery is doing the work you want it to do. When your battery dies, all we do is put it in the recharger, where the chemical reactions are essentially reversed, and the lithium is held in that carbon anode until you want to use it again. So, lithium-ion batteries are popular because, one, they're rechargeable, and two, they can store a lot of electricity in a low-mass material, meaning our batteries can be small and light, even though we demand a lot of them. One downside to traditional lithium-ion battery materials compared to other battery materials is that they actually recharge relatively slowly. One solution to that is to make that metal cathode nanoscale. Essentially, by increasing the surface area to volume ratio of that cathode, it's easier and faster for those lithium ions to go in and out of the material. We also expect lithium ion batteries with nanoscale cathodes to experience less mechanical wear and tear, lasting longer. Because nanoscale um, lithium-ion battery cathodes have so much potential, manufacturers are already incorporating nanoscale materials into their batteries. One material that's being commonly used is something called nanoscale nickel-manganese-cobalt oxide. I'll call it NMC for short. Here on the periodic table, I've highlighted nickel, manganese, and cobalt. Note that they're close together on the periodic table. And when I picture this NMC material, this is the way I picture it. 
So note that these spheres are atoms, not nanoparticles. Atoms are much smaller than the nanoparticles that I've already been talking about. And in this case, you'll notice that the atoms are arranged in a really interesting way. There's this beautiful layered structure, and those yellow spheres, the lithium ions, have clear channels to go into and out of. Also note that the red, blue, and pink spheres, representing nickel, manganese, and cobalt, have similar locations in that atomic lattice. That's because they have sim similar properties, because they're near each other on the periodic table. That ends up being important because it means you can tune the amount of nickel, manganese, and cobalt. You can have equal amounts of them, or you could increase one at the expense of the other two and change the battery performance. So nanoscale NMC, this material, has so much promise that it's already incorporated into products that you can buy and drive. So these electric vehicles contain nanoscale NMC and related materials. And I'll say that when you buy one of these cars, of course, the nanoscale NMC is safely packaged inside that battery. Despite that, some colleagues and I thought that it would be prudent to think ahead to any potential environmental impacts that nanoscale NMC might have, one, because of the large scale of use, and two, because there's little to no recycling infrastructure for these materials, meaning that they will likely enter our waste stream. So to give you a sense for scale of use, by 2020, estimates suggest that there will be 20 million electric vehicles on the road. Each one of these vehicles contains about 38 kilograms of nanoscale NMC. Taken together, we expect more than 10 to the 9 kilograms of nanoscale NMC on our roads by 2020. This is actually great news, right? More electric vehicles with more efficient batteries is definitely a good thing but we would be smart to pay attention to see if there are any environmental implications that come with this new um, ability. So how do you test to see if nanoscale NMC is safe for sustainable use? You can't possibly pick every elemental composition and every shape of nanoparticle and test it across every organism in our ecosystem. That is a completely intractable problem. So collaborators and I at the Center for Sustainable Nanotechnology decided to pick representative organisms from our ecosystem and systematically expose them to carefully synthesized and characterized nanoscale NMC. Now, our goal here is not to figure out um, just toxicity, to understand with one particular nanoparticle how toxic it is to a particular organism. What we really want is molecular level insight into the nanoparticle biological interaction so that we can generalize to achieve design rules for sustainable nanotechnology in general. So first we had to make the nanoscale NMC like you find in commercial batteries. Here's some of the material that we made. You can see in these beautiful images that we have these sheet-like particles. On the top is a top view and on the bottom is a side view of these nanoscale NMC sheets. The dark lines you see are the channels that the lithium ions can go into and out of. And we started with the simplest elemental composition we could imagine, equal amounts of nickel, manganese, and cobalt in these particles. And what we did is we systematically exposed various organisms to our nanoscale NMC, ranging from simple model cell membranes up to multicellular aquatic organisms that are common test species for the United States Environmental Protection Agency. One type of organism we're particularly interested in are bacteria, for a variety of reasons. Many bacteria live in the sediment and soil, which is where we expect nanoparticles to accumulate if they end up in the environment. Bacteria are also at the bottom of the food web, which means that they and any nanoparticles attached to them are likely to be ingested by higher order organisms. And third, bacteria are really important to our ecosystem. So if their function is compromised, that could have some real impacts. There are lots and lots of types of bacteria in our environment. Um, I'm going to tell you today about one specific type of bacterium that's important in our environment called Schuonella, pictured here. So we did systematic experiments where we exposed our Schuonella to our nanoscale nickel manganese cobalt oxide, or NMC. And I'll tell you, our initial hypothesis was that those nanoscale sheets were going to cut through the bacterial membranes like a nanoscale knife, decreasing bacterial viability. In fact, that's not what we saw at all. Um, there was no sign of them cutting into the membranes. But what we did see when we were tracking the bacteria is that in the presence of the nanoscale NMC, they weren't using oxygen like we expected, and they weren't replicating like we expected. Of course, what we wanted to know was why they weren't functioning as we expected them to. If we could understand the molecular reason for the bacterial suffering, we might be able to redesign our particle and mitigate the impact. So after lots of experiments by hardworking chemistry graduate students, we uncovered the reason that the nanoscale NMC was toxic to the bacteria. When we put the nanoscale NMC into water, which is pretty much unavoidable if it enters our environment, 
those nickel, manganese, and cobalt atoms were dissolving out of the solid material and becoming ionic species floating around in the solution around them. It was the nanoscale chemistry of the nickel and the cobalt ions that were causing trouble for the Shuanella. So the next question is, how can we redesign nanoscale NMC so that it's still a great battery material, but it's no longer releasing those toxic nickel and cobalt ions? My first instinct was to create a coating, put something on the outside of the NMC so that it never interacts with water, and then it never dissolves. That's not a great solution, though, because that would also keep lithium ions from coming into contact with the NMC, which means it would no longer discharge or charge as a battery. If we can make the material totally safe, but it's also no longer functional as a battery, that's pretty much useless, right? So instead, we decided we would vary the elemental composition. We'd vary the amount of nickel, manganese, and cobalt, because we knew the nickel and the cobalt were the bad actors. We can decrease the amount of nickel and cobalt. We can't eliminate it completely and still get all the advantages of nanoscale NMC, but we designed a series of nanoscale NMC um, formulations using chemical reactions, like the one you see here, where we increased the amount of manganese at the expense of the nickel and cobalt. And then we did the same experiments with our Shuanella to see if our redesign had worked. And we were really excited to see that when we put them in with the Shuanella, we saw that as we decreased the nickel and cobalt, we saw a commensurate decrease in the toxicity in the bacteria. That arrow is showing you bacterial function moving towards that of a nanoparticle-free control. So this is a great example of proactively designing materials so that we can get maximal technological impact and minimal environmental consequences. With this example in mind, where this molecular level insight helps us promote sustainable nanotechnology, I'd like you to go beyond this one energy example and think about some other areas where nanoparticles might influence our society. Can you imagine a world where nanoparticles help us come up with new ways to do biomedical imaging, new ways to freeze and rewarm organs that have been donated, new ways to deliver chemotherapeutics that have minimal side effects, overcoming major health challenges? Can you imagine a world where nanoparticles deliver nutrients to our crops and act as insecticides and pesticides that self-destruct after they've done their job, overcoming major food challenges? Can you imagine a world where nanoparticles remediate our water of toxic chemicals like arsenic and lead, or where nanoparticles embedded in filters help to kill pathogenic bacteria in our water supplies? I can. In fact, all of these projects are already in progress in labs across the United States and the globe hopefully keeping considerations of safety in mind. I hope that even if you hated chemistry in high school or you wish that I had blown something up for you here on the stage today, that you agree with me that nanoscale chemistry has the potential to overcome some of society's greatest technological challenges, all while also taking care of the environment. Thanks.